Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the BSRA and the Biochemical Society, we'd like to welcome you to today's public webinar, which is part of the Metabolism of Aging online conference. My name's Zoe Worko and my co-presenter is James Brown. And we're going to be talking about intergenerational activity and frailty and the legacy of old people's home for four-year-olds. Before we start, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talks. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for where possible, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. So my name's uh, Professor Zoe Worko, um, and I work for a company called Riverstone, but until February this year, I was a NHS um, consultant specialising in the healthcare of older people and I still very much specialise in the healthcare of older people but I've been given a wonderful opportunity to um, try and make things better rather than just pick up the pieces um, at the end and I was involved with the programme Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds which is where I actually finally met James after hearing about him for, for years. Do you want to introduce yourself James? Hi everybody, I'm Dr. James Brown. I'm an Associate Professor of Biomedical Science at Aston University and Deputy Director of the Aston Research Centre for Healthy Ageing. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Zoe on Series 2 of All People's Home for Four-Year-Olds and to get to know, more importantly really, all of the older people involved in the programme and to see, as you'll see later on in the presentation, the impact that it had on their lives. So you can see the plan we've got here very briefly. We're going to talk a little bit about ageing, what is ageing, and about frailty, what frailty is. We'll then focus a little bit on the concept of intergenerational research, the different types, how they can be applied and who benefits from them, before we'll specifically focus on what we saw in series two of Old People's Home for four-year-olds. What did we find as the result of these intergenerational activities, and why do we think we find those changes? So we'll start by talking about ageing and frailty. Here you can see a depiction of the apocryphal fountain of youth, and it shows you that we've been obsessed with the idea of ageing and mortality for a very long time. But what is ageing, biologically speaking? Broadly, the term ageing describes the biological changes that occur over the course of adult life. Now, these changes often lead to a gradual decline in function and an increased risk of dying. That loss of function, uh, which is associated with ageing, manifests itself in a reduced ability to withstand the challenges we face every day, such as infections or accidents or illnesses. Now, importantly, not everybody ages at the same rate, not even within a person's own body do their organs and tissues age at the same rate. So we know that ageing seems to be quite malleable, depending on a number of different factors. But Aging itself is thought to be almost universal. There are some organisms, we'll see on the next slide, particularly the Quahog clam, Arctic Rylandica, which is thought to either not age at all, or is thought to age so slowly as to, to for it to not be a meaningful process. So you can see some of these organisms here uh, and the rates at which they age, or, or the, the, the longevity they manage to achieve. And a lot of these, as you can see, are aquatic. So a rockfish can live to be over 200 years. Sturgeon over 150 years, same as a, an, an Aldabra tortoise, koi carp over 200 years, bowhead whales over 200 years, red sea urchins um, is thought again may have either immortality or such extended lifespan as to be practically immortal. And then the, the poster child, if you like, for biogerontology or the study of the biology of ageing is the Quahog clam, Arctica islandica. And the oldest one of these um, was found to be 507 years old. And as is typical with scientists, the way in which we found that out was to kill it and count the rings on its shell and work out that it had been through 507 seasons or years. So we found the oldest thing or the oldest living animal on the planet and we killed it to work out how old it was. And Arctic Rylander is thought to be one of possibly seven organisms that might not age at all. You can see towards the bottom of this slide the, the Anage database, which if you Google that, it lists um, some of the organisms uh, which you can find that have incredibly long lifespans. So that suggests to us that ageing is probably a universal process. So if you look at our longevity as humans, 
Um, there's some interesting things we need to talk about before we start to talk about the success or unsuccess um, of aging. So we know that we're living longer, and this is obviously wonderful news. So by 2030, a quarter of the world's population will be over what we used to consider to be pensionable age, or 65. And in the UK alone, it's thought by 2030 that there'll be 5 million people who've lived into deep old age, over the age of 80. So on average, we're living longer. Now, some of those uh, big leaps in the last century in terms of longevity are due to improved sanitation, improved medical care, reduced child mortality. But we are generally seeing more and more people live into older age. So our longevity or lifespan has been increasing. The problem we have is that our health expectancy, also known as health span, is increasing at a slower rate, or up until recently was increasing at a slower rate, but is now even decreasing since the latest figures came out. These figures are a couple of years out of date. But you can see that in terms of the number of healthy years we can expect, for males, you can expect, it's now actually, I think, 62.9 rather than 64, healthy years out of around 79.2 years of longevity. And for females, again, that figure's dropped recently. I think it's just under 65 healthy years out of just over 82 years of longevity. So although we're living longer, we're spending proportionally fewer of those years in good health. So we're not living healthier. And what you can see from this graph is that those years spent in poor health almost all happen at the end of life. So we get to around the age of 60 years old, and then we start to see uh, age-related diseases, the kind of things you'll be aware of, cardiovascular disease and diabetes and Alzheimer's disease and osteoarthritis and lots of diseases and conditions which significantly impact the lives of older adults, have a very large cost associated with them in terms of providing uh, healthcare services for older adults, and most importantly, really, affect the quality of life of older adults as they reach the time of their life when they should be able to enjoy not having to work and being retired. But instead, what we see is that people get to, towards retirement age and then have a number of often coexisting medical conditions which have an impact on their quality of life. So this health span issue is very important, and most of us who are interested in the biology of aging don't really have the aim to extend lifespan. We don't want everybody to live until we're 150, but we do want to try and identify ways in which we can compress that morbidity or that disease at the end of our lives into the shortest possible window so that we all live a happy and healthy older age. And the way in which to do that is to be a successful ager. So this is the last slide before I pass on to Zoe, and we can, broadly speaking, kind of categorise, if you like, people's ageing trajectories into being successful or unsuccessful. And that's not really about longevity, but it is about retaining physical function into later life, avoiding uh, what we're going to talk about later, which is frailty, and, and maintaining your independence. And if you do that, you're really a successful ager. And we know there are a number of different influences over whether you'll be a successful ager, or an unsuccessful ager. So there are genetic influences. We know that there are certain individuals who pass on inherited factors which can increase the possibility that they will live to be 100 years old. There are other related factors known as epigenetic factors, um, which again can predict um, from a very early age your aging trajectory. And we even know that things that occur before you're born, so things you're exposed to when you're in the womb, for example, can have an impact on whether or not you're going to, to age well or whether you're going to have issues in older age. The third factor, which has a, a circle around it, is there because this is really the realm that we have a lot of control over. So there are environmental factors which can have a big influence over whether we age successfully. And the best example really is smoking. So we know that there's almost nothing that ages you faster than smoking. And therefore, reducing uh, or quitting, hopefully, smoking can have not just an impact on your risk of lung cancer and your general health, but also how successfully you age. We know that your diet, both in terms of the amount of calories you consume and the, the, the broadness, if you like, of that diet, so the different nutrients that you consume, has an impact on how successfully you age. Your levels of exercise and physical activity 
sadly, some things which are, are, are less modifiable, like deprivation, um, have an impact on aging. But all of these environmental factors provide us with opportunities, in many cases, to try and ensure that more people age successfully than currently do. I'm now going to pass you over to Zoe for the next few slides. Lovely, thanks James. So I'm going to talk a bit about frailty. So what frailty is and actually really importantly what frailty isn't. So um, when I was still doing clinical work I worked predominantly in the accident and emergency department seeing older people as they came to hospital and importantly I saw them whether or not they were living with frailty and that's a really important differentiation because we're seeing a real um, segregation of services at the moment and I think potentially we're missing a trick on that one. So my team used to see everybody. I also used to spend a lot of time talking to people, clinicians, other healthcare professionals who really weren't that interested in older people. They'd gone into healthcare sort of kidding themselves that they might be looking after younger people rather than the majority of their patients would be older. So I used to spend a lot of time telling them what frailty is and what it isn't. And one of the first things really is that frailty has been used really now as a euphemism for ageism. So um, the General Medical Council published some brilliant guidance which said to doctors, you are not allowed to be ageist, you are not allowed to discriminate against people on age alone. So at that point, everybody started saying, well, let's just say all older adults are frail then, or living with frailty, except they would say that frail old lady. So I, you know, educating them about why that is and isn't true, and why also you shouldn't discriminate on age alone, you just need to have a look at the whole person. So what is frailty? The important thing to note is that it's a clinical syndrome. And by syndrome, we mean it's a group of symptoms that collectively indicate or characterize a disorder. So if you think about other medical conditions, there are some phenomenally complicated ones, lots of autoimmune ones, things like lupus, uh, the uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, things such as that, which are considered to be a syndrome and, and treated as a real you know, specialist area. And then there's frailty, which is even more complicated than that that sort of gets shoved to the bottom of the pile, unfortunately. It's a progressive condition, five to 15 years, but what's important to note is that it is not modifiable. And that's really what James and I are going to be addressing here. It's stable, but then with episodic deteriorations, and those deteriorations can be triggered by all sorts of things. So it could be delirium, um, which is a whole other uh, topic on its own, but uh, temporary mental impairment associated with some other sort of insult. It could be falls, it could be immobility, it could be an acute illness, it could be somebody who's been incredibly robust beforehand, but then has something significant happen to them and comes out of the other end frail. It's physical and mental. There's a new term, people are starting to talk about mental frailty, but again, I think that's missing the point because really we know that the, the physical body and the mind interact in so many ways, and we often don't appreciate that in physical health care. And it's a cycle of decline as well, and that's really important to note. And by addressing one bit of it, so the physical or the mental bit, you can actually help lift the other. And what's really important and has led to better funding, um, better research, and actually better recognition, was um, one of the recent National Clinical Directors for Older People, uh, John Young, managing to get frailty branded as a long-term condition. So in the same um, cohort as diabetes, as chronic obstructive airways disease, and having it regarded as a long-term condition has been really helpful. When I did my training to, to become a geriatrician, um, there's a specific curriculum, it's a five-year training course, it's now a four-year training course after you've already been a doctor for um, at least six or seven years, and there was only one mention of frailty in the curriculum at that point. The curriculum is now absolutely saturated with the word frailty, again, which just shows how much things have come on. So what isn't it? So when I gave this or a talk some to this to cardiologists, the one thing I wanted them to remember was a very simple pie chart that I'd drawn for them, which had two categories, frail and not frail at the age of 85. And it's around one third of those aged over 85 are living with frailty. So there are more older adults who are not living with frailty and do not develop the frailty syndrome than do. And then there's conflict over the prevalence into deep old age because it depends on which cohort you're looking at. So if you've got a, a really interested fit older adult cohort who volunteered for all sorts of research, you're going to have lower rates of frailty. 
If you're only measuring frailty in the hospitalised cohort, you're going to have much, much higher levels, and particularly if it's at a time of acute illness. So we really don't know whether it goes up or down. There's data saying it goes either way. It's absolutely not an end of the bed diagnosis. You can't stand and look at something and go, oh, they're frail. Sometimes you can, but only if you are specially trained in it. But there are scores and it's as with any medical condition, it's a diagnosis and that's really important. I'm just going to touch on that. And it isn't untreatable. Again, that's really important. So comprehensive assessment and management by a skilled and specialist multidisciplinary team. And by that, I mean nurses, doctors, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, dietitian and others, which really we'll touch on, can really improve outcomes. This is a rather lovely cartoon um, by a colleague who works down in Brighton called Muna, and I've used this to illustrate really how a specialist in looking after older people actually will view that older person who's got lots of things wrong with them. We don't see the person as the sum of their organs and how do we sort that one organ about. It's all about function, it's about what matters to that person and genuinely it is as unglamorous cutting people's toenails um, that was one of the good advantages of all the PPE that came in for COVID. I at least finally had eye protection when having to take a pair of clippers to some very long, uh, robust toenails um, in the emergency department, because me cutting that lady's toenails made the difference to that person being able to go home or ending up hospitalised. So progress in frailty, I've mentioned it, it, it wasn't really um, referred to at all, came with, that, with having a definition for it. And these started sort of coming out uh, 20, 2008 onwards. Before that, it will have been lots of my fellow geriatricians, many of whom at that point wore tweed jackets, had elbow patches and, and beards, you know, would do the, I can recognise frailty, I know it when I see it, which they would be accurate in doing. But then just having a really simple definition, I like this one, it does exactly what it says on the tin, clinically recognisable, so we can test for it and look for it, increased vulnerability, it's ageing associated, but not inevitable. And ageing associated, you can be under 65 and still develop frailty, depending on what has happened to you. But it's across multiple physiologic systems, so you cannot cope with everyday or acute stresses. Really sums it up very nicely. This is a little sketch that I would draw out um, and show to patients and their relatives when I was trying to explain what was happening. Um, and John Young in the reference here is the um, former National Clinical Director who managed to get frailty recognised as a long term condition. Um, and I want you to picture me after one of my falls. I am a frequent faller. I'm very clumsy. And um, a few years ago, I caught my toe on a curb. Um, had a laptop in my bag under my arm, tripped over and managed to crack a rib on my laptop. The NHS laptop was completely undamaged in the process. I, however, was damaged. I couldn't breathe in because I was in pain. I couldn't take painkillers because they made me go dizzy. So I did have to take them so I could breathe, but then I actually couldn't stand up. Um, I had to ask somebody to come and help me. Um, and after the inevitable Mickey taking had taken place, they came and helped me but I was able to recover really quite quickly. So I had my dip in function, I'm the green line at the top, I was able to recover quickly and then get back to normal. Around the same time I was shuffling around doing a post-take wardrobe because doctors are very bad at taking time off of sick, off sick. And I met a lady who'd fallen in her kitchen. Simple trip, not a collapse, so similar to I'd done. Um, and she'd fallen and broken a couple of her ribs but she had a background of lung cancer, she had airways disease, she'd been on steroids a lot, which is why her bones were thin as well, and she'd broken a couple of ribs. She had to be hospitalised, she did have people who could help her and they tried to help her, but she couldn't get the balance between painkillers and being able to breathe right at home. And she came into hospital and she became dependent and she did recover eventually, but nowhere near back to the level that she was before. And it took her weeks to get better. So I saw her when she first came in and then she ended up on my delayed transfer of care ward. And that's the difference that living with frailty um, can make to somebody. And you can also see as well, even if you haven't yet developed frailty, if you're what we call vulnerable, you can actually dip. And because you won't get back up to where you were previously, you can edge into frailty. So you get longer recovery and you don't get back to your pre-morbid baseline. But why does it happen? Because if you want to solve a problem, you need to understand why that problem is happening. We don't know. That's the really difficult issue. There's no single process. We know what some of them are. We've got good ideas about others, but we really don't know. Another word that didn't used to exist, sarcopenia, 
So many people have heard of osteopenia, so thinning of bones, which then turns into osteoporosis, sarcopenia, thinning of muscles. Definitely has a role in frailty, definitely a link, but actually a chicken and egg situation. So which actually starts to come first? Do the muscles um, start to atrophy and then frailty comes on? Is it the other way around? We know that comorbidities, as James has mentioned, are really important, but also 25% of those living with frailty don't have an identified chronic disease. So genuinely in those, it really does look like an, an age associated decline. There's the myth that um, people with frailty are skinny. Unfortunately not. So between 10 and 30% of those living with frailty are obese and they're at bigger risk because it just doesn't get noticed. They can you know, be deemed as lazy when actually maybe they can't be doing some of the things that, that we would like them to do. Then the big area of research and colleagues at the University of Birmingham in, and in the Institute of Inflammaging, so inflammation and research are doing some great work here, looking at hormones, coagulation factors, um, inflammatory markers to see, is there a role here? So it's a vital and growing area of research. And as this develops more together with the research on sarcopenia, maybe we'll start to get some answers and maybe we'll be able to, to treat frailty in, a, in extra ways to we do at the moment, because I don't think the core message will change. So I mentioned you could identify frailty. Luckily, geriatricians are generally a nice bunch who tend to get on. So we don't tend to compete and have multiple definitions of the same thing. We tend to settle on one and go, we like your score, we'll just go for it. Simultaneously, two different people came out with really good results here. So Freed, an American researcher, and actually this was a byproduct of a cardiac study, identified a frailty phenotype, and she identified low grip strength, low energy, slow walking speed, low physical activity, and unintentional um, weight loss as contributing to the frailty phenotype. We then have an absolute legend called Ken Rockwood, who is a wonderful Canadian gentleman, he comes over and presents at conferences, stands by his poster and just says, hi, I'm Ken, I'm from Canada. And everybody's taking selfies with him going, can we have your autograph, Ken? He's absolutely brilliant. Um, and he came up with the deficit accumulation um, theory. And initially he looked at almost sort of almost 300 different variables, looking at symptom signs, diseases, disabilities. Could people access help when they needed it? That, that real thing that, that gives a picture of somebody's life and came up with the deficit accumulation school. And then since then has worked to distill that down in ways that we can use it in everyday clinical practice, and it can be used in much simpler forms of research. Andy Clegg again, um, and these are some Kaplan-Meier curves from one of the really important pieces of research. So this has been distilling Ken Rockwood's um, deficit accumulation scale into read codes that are automatically entered into the British GP notes system. So that all a doctor has to do is press a button and it can calculate a frailty score for the electronic frailty index for somebody aged over 65. The reason it matters, there are different levels of survival um, institutionalization associated with it, which is what's shown by the Kaplan-Meier curves here. Also, it shows that just because you are severely frail doesn't mean you will definitely be dead in five years time. Again, something I used to remind particularly the cardiology colleagues of. I know if there's any cardiologists listening, I love them really. But, you know, um, it was my favourite group for talking to about this. But this is why it's important. And actually, the outcomes from both um, Freed and Rockwood's work is really, really similar. This photo was uh, taken from my ward with permission um, of the uh, relative and the um, patient. Uh, she had memory problems. So her daughter wrote her this sign and just stuck it on her frame. And it, it, it worked, actually. So what can we do about frailty? So I've already said that it's interdisciplinary, multidimensional involves the patient and is very much a process and not an event. So something that happens over time rather than a you know, typical medical treatment. Um, the earlier it happens, the better. An integrated plan for treatment, support, rehabilitation and somebody's life in the long term. And actually what matters to that person? Now, this has got a really horrible name when we do it in hospital. It's called Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment. When I was secretary of the British Geriatric Society, I wanted to change it. I wanted to call it something so that we could publicise it and you know, get people going to hospital asking for it or saying, has my mum had her assessment? But I wasn't allowed to do that. But, you know, the battles you can win. So in hospital, something called Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment. But this is what it does. 
And I want you to bear this in mind as we're going on to talk about what we did during Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds, because different titles, different places, but some great similarities. And back over to James. Thank you, Zoe. So we're going to talk now about intergenerational research, which was the, the basis, or if you like, the intervention which we used in Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds, both Series 1 and Series 2. Now, although this was very new to the UK in terms of public awareness when Series 1 came out, it's not new in terms of research. And it's been happening, at least in Japan, since the 1970s. And the idea is that you take two uh, populations of people who are separated by their age and get them to undertake activities together. And we found from these decades of research that there are benefits for both groups. So for older adults, you end up with um, being more, more up to date with trends and not being so isolated around technology. You often see an increase in physical activity, mental activity and, and creativeness. You can see in some adults improvements in cognitive function or thinking skills. And certainly, and this is really important, more opportunities for social inclusion because social isolation social isolation is a very serious problem in older adults that can have a significant impact not just on quality of life but also um, risk of death. Um, for young people that are involved in intergenerational activities they often get the opportunity to learn values and norms and importantly how to interact with older people. It changes their perception of older people so when you look at the, the type of words they would use to describe old people they might say slow boring fuddy duddy before they do intergenerational research and often afterwards they'll use terms like funny exciting have lots of stories so it changes the way in which young people view older people and then for both groups you see you know, the chance to discover much from each other about how they view the world the chance to the chance to enjoy fun activities while they're undertaking these intergenerational activities, improvements in confidence, self-esteem and mood, and lots of other improvements. So it's a well-established type of intervention which has benefits both for the older adults and the young children involved in the activities. There are lots of different types, specific structures for intergenerational study types. So you can have programs that are based around art. So that could be um, visual arts. It could be crafting or making things or dance. Um, for example, there could be music. So it could be that you're playing music, you're listening to music. You can see others listed here, specifically education type intergenerational studies. Um, where you've got children learning about some of the issues associated with older age or, or both groups being involved in the learning process. Importantly, there are some narrative based activities and these are very beneficial, uh, particularly for the older adults. So reminiscence based therapy. So that can be simple or group reminiscence. It can be getting out a, a box of props. It can be looking at old photographs and then getting both the older adults and the children to talk about those props, to talk about those memories. Um, and finally, recreation, the most fun part. So things like gardening together, board games, baking, which as we found out in old people's home is very messy, um, <laughs> word games, or going on nature walks. So there are lots of different ways in which you can get older adults um, in a number of different settings to engage with children in an intergenerational program. Which brings me to old people's home for four-year-olds. So this was a Channel 4 television program, which was commissioned um, by a production company called CPL. And they had this kind of unique idea that they wanted to bring together some older adults and some children in series one for six weeks to see what impact it had on the older adults. Now, we're actually going to talk about series two of Old People's Home for four year olds because it was a slightly longer intervention. It was a 10 week intervention and we had more adults and more children involved. If you could just go to the next slide, Zoe, please. Now you can see a slightly clearer picture of some of those faces. If you watch the program, then you'll remember some of these faces and some of the names. So for example, you can see where is she? Yeah, you can see Victor, who was 97 at the time, right in the middle, sat down with a bow tie in the front row. Um, Victor was relatively socially isolated at the start of this um, program. And this if you like evidence is one of the one of the interesting approaches the program had we had older adults that had a wide range of abilities functional abilities um, health statuses and social activities so we had people like victor who at 97 was incredible but didn't really have a lot of social activity and we had other people who 
had you know poorer health than Victor, but a much broader level of social um, circle, if you like. The one person I'm just going to bring your attention to because I absolutely adored her, sat next to Victor on his left. You can see Sylvia wearing a lilac top. Sylvia was 102 when we started filming Old People's Home for four-year-olds. And she was actually the hardest person for Channel Pod 4 to cast because every time they wanted to do a screen test, she was out seeing people or doing things, which at 102 years old is, is pretty astonishing. If you could just pop to the next slide, Zoe, that'd be great. And this um, is an example of Sylvia at 102. which I think is just amazing. If I can if I can still shoot hoops, well, if I'm still alive at 102, I think I'll have done well, let alone be able to play basketball. Um, and, and really, for me, this is a hashtag which we, we used at the time. Um, successful aging is not just about longevity, it's about maintaining physical function in, in many ways. And if we could all be like Sylvia, then the impact it would have on our society on the amount it, it costs us to look after older adults and generally the health and well-being of older adults it would be incredible sadly sylvia um passed away last year at 104 which was very sad for all of us but again she was just a unique uh, a unique lady with unique abilities so moving on we put together a program of activities which included lots of the things which we talked about in previous slides and lots of arts and crafts and baking and singing and dancing um, and reminiscence uh, therapy which allowed our older adults to build relationships with the children and we decided at the start of the process that what we would do is we'd have an early years specialist who would look at any of the changes which we saw in the three or four year olds who were involved in the program but we as a group of um, people who work in either uh, gerontology or biogerontology wanted to look at some of the physical function and, and cognitive function, as well as markers of, of, kind of wellness and quality of life in our older adults. So these are some of the physical changes which we saw in just 10 weeks um, of, let's say, for example, no structured physical activity, no structured changes in diet, just shared meal times, shared activities. Um, it is relatively low end numbers, so although you can see markers of statistical significance, um, you can maybe take them with a bit of pinch of salt, but what you can see is here, this is the amount of time, the timed up and go test is the amount of time it takes an older adult to stand up from a chair and start moving. And it's a good marker of your um, functional independence because you don't need help getting out of a chair and it shows that you've got good uh, coordination and muscle power. And you can see that we saw a decrease in the amount of time it took our older adults to get up out of a chair and start moving, which is a really positive thing. Next slide, please. We also looked at grip strength. And as we mentioned a bit earlier on, that in Freed's model of frailty, grip strength is one of the five factors which can predict or help you measure whether an individual is non-frail, pre-frail, or frail. And we saw some Again, considering there were no structured physical activity or strength training exercises, we weren't getting them off camera to lift weights with barbells and resistance bands. But what we saw in just 10 weeks was an increase in grip strength in almost every adult. There were a couple of people where it remained the same. And we actually saw in, in some individuals, Ken, for example, who, who had um, tremor, um, actually went from really struggling with using that hand to, to using it for a number of different activities but saw remarkable increases in his grip strength now it's it's unlikely that this is suddenly due to a massive increase in muscle mass in the older adults in these 10 weeks but there are a number of different factors which may have changed their psychological approach to using the grip strength tester so at first they may be a little bit afraid to squeeze it too hard they're not very confident but after 10 weeks of intergenerational activity what we saw was an increased grip strength in our older adults. Um, oh, and as classically, I've got a graph here where I haven't actually put the name of the, of the test in there, which is hilarious. But whatever it was, you can see, I know, balance clear, right? I can see it now, apologies. So we did a balance test. Now, balance is very important because poor balance can predict your risk of falls. Now, if you're like Zoe and young and fit and healthy and, and a fall may lead to a broken rib, but you can recover quite quickly. As an older adult, a fall can be very serious, particularly if it's associated with what we call a long life. So if you're on your own and you fall at home on a cold, hard floor 
and end up lying there for a long time, this can be a, a life-threatening um, event. And because balance is so important, we measured it at the start and at the end, and you can see actually that we saw an improvement in balance, again, just in 10 weeks, across our 10 older adults without any structured balance training or physical activity. Next slide, please. We were interested as well in, um, in looking, at how, looking at the mood of our older adults. Um, and you can see here that using something known as a geriatric depression scale, we saw a decrease in the kind of symptoms you would associate with depression in older adults. So effectively, our older adults were happier after spending 10 weeks time with the children. Using a, a slightly different frailty scale, we didn't see a significant difference from baseline um, to the end of the, of the program, which is understandable in many ways, because again, we, we hadn't had very long to work with them. We didn't get the opportunity to do the kind of structured physical activity, physiotherapy type interventions, and nor did we have um, a structured uh, nutrition or dietetic intervention, but we did see that they were generally more physically active. We did measure their steps throughout the process, and what we actually saw was that from baseline to the halfway through, pretty much everybody increased the amount of activity they did, but then a little bit of tiredness crept in because we were asking our older adults to come in five days a week and to get involved in these activities, so we, we tended to see the step count either plateau or decrease a little bit from week five to week ten. Uh, and therefore, when you see something like a frailty scale at the end of 10 weeks, we have to take into account that there was maybe a little bit of, of tiredness involved, but we didn't see a specific change in frailty, which is understandable because, again, there were no structured um, frailty-specific interventions. It was just time spent around children. We also looked at cognitive changes. So these are changes in kind of thinking skills, which are obviously very important um, throughout life, but particularly in older adults when we see an increased risk for conditions like uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So we did uh, some tests to measure cognitive uh, function. And what we saw is that there was a slight improvement in cognitive function using a, a specific test um, which is marketed and, and used on an iPad. And um, you can see that from this graph, almost everybody, I think everybody apart from one person saw an in increase in their cognitive score. And, and the person that didn't, I think, um, uh, didn't really like the system and I know from speaking to them wasn't in a particularly good mood on the day so that may be a slight false negative in terms of their change in cognition but we saw an improvement in cognitive function in just 10 weeks of intergenerational activity. And again, this is, this is classic me, I, uh, I've left off that graph um, what the test was but whatever it was we clearly saw an improvement in it. So to finish off, next slide please. So to finish off, effectively what we saw was in just a 10 week kind of semi-structured intergenerational program where older adults spent um, their time in a nursery which we built at a residential village. Um, we saw in just 10 weeks, we saw improvements in, in physical function, we saw improvements in cognitive function, we saw improvements in mood. And the big question is, well, why did it work? Because as I said, there was no structured physical activity. We weren't getting them to run or lift weights. We weren't measuring how much food they were eating. But if you look at the kind of activities that they got involved with, again, so lots of arts and crafts, um, lots of music, and we actually prepared them for a dance. Um, some lots of narrative based activities. So again, reminiscence therapy, getting them to look at photos and, and, and talk to the older adults about how they remembered older birthdays, for example, and lots of recreation, um, gardening, board games, etc., which did involve some increased physical activity because anybody uh, in the audience that has a three or four year old um, will probably be able to tell you that they don't generally tend to sit still very much and that they tend to like to move about very quickly and play on the floor and then on the table. So we did see our older adults moving about more and we also saw in some of our older adults that they had a more structured dietary input because we would have shared lunches. We saw some individuals, Sylvia for example, who went from eating like a bird to practically eating like a horse because she would um, finally have a, a healthier eating environment where she could sit with her friends and eat the food that we provided. 
And effectively, the reason it worked was we took a bunch of older adults and challenged them physically and mentally. One of the things which often happens as older adults move from living independently to living in some type of accommodation where there's a level of dependence is we wrap them up in cotton wool and we say, don't do that because there's risk. Don't do that because there's risk. We're actually a, a moderate amount of challenge sometimes allows older adults to maintain independence and to keep their physical fitness. And equally and really importantly, we created long lasting friendships and relationships. So there are still ongoing relationships between the older adults and the children. They still meet up regularly to have lunch um, and to, to, to particularly the, with the pairing off that we saw, for example, with Ken and Lily Bobtail, um, they are now effectively like family to each other. So these meaningful activities had an impact on the physical and mental well-being, but also created long-lasting friendships and relationships. I'll pass you back over to Zoe now. Thanks, James. So just for the last few minutes, um, as we draw to a close, I also want to comment on the, the sort of why did it work and the things that we saw that we didn't measure. And this was the, the delight of having the cameras there. And it's really around that, that friendships and, and the purposeful activity. So the relationships our older adults and children could build were only focused on them. So there was no caring relationship going on. So there was no hurry up, um, no distraction, put your shoes on, we've got to go somewhere, no distraction by mobile phones. So they actually had time for each other and they were able to talk and they weren't interrupted. And that sort of meaningful time and meaningful activity. The older adults might have been doing things that they were doing anyway as hobbies, but they were actually doing it for a reason because of the children being there. Even if that was only a perceived reason, that, that's what makes the difference. And the two ladies in purple on um, James's photo of the sofa. So first of all, Sylvia. So although she was really hard to track down to start with, when we first met Sylvia, she was taken everywhere. She was pushed around in her wheelchair, despite being perfectly able to walk. And yeah, she was taken to where she needed to be. And if you met Sylvia, she had a very happy but blank expression, quite typical of somebody with dementia, and she was labelled as having cognitive impairment. And I noticed something was up about five weeks in where we had some goats in for the day in the middle of the um, nursery room, which was brilliant fun. And everyone had gone out for their lunch, which, as we've just discovered, Sylvia enjoyed. And she walked back into the room and we thought, well, what's going on? For one, she's walking back into the room at that point rather than waiting for somebody to push her. And she went and picked her handbag up off the back of the chair that she'd left it on and walked out with it. Now, at the start, she was pushed everywhere. And if you said to her, Sylvia, did you bring a coat today? She'd just giggle and make quite a rude joke because Sylvia made lots of rude jokes. And that was the point. I realised that Sylvia didn't have dementia. She was just bored. And I think being part of the programme is why Sylvia lived to 104. Um, I think it had a real impact. And the other lady in purple who was a particular favourite of mine, Lavinia, and Lavinia also unfortunately died last year. But Lavinia had really severe Parkinson's disease and felt very ostracised from the rest of um, uh, the people in the community they were living in because she had visible disabilities. She had a terrible fall one day, cracking black eye, worse than James's, which he's trying to not tell you about, but I've got to point it out. Um, needing a hospital stay completely appropriately and she got herself out of hospital after less than 24 hours because she felt that the children needed her we'd also seen her go off road with her delta the three-wheeler walker because she she wanted to get to the swing set that all the older older adults were able to get to and the children were there and just having that reason to do that meaningful activity actually gave her purpose and meant she could achieve so the joys of having cameras you can just see so much more than you know, just on the on the official tests. So what were the after effects? Well, they've been interrupted by COVID, I think it's fair to say. But I was really, really worried that this would get grasped on by a big company and almost be copyrighted and labelled and be seen as our thing. But what we've seen is a real grassroots approach to it. It seemed that we empowered and enabled groups children's groups, um, older people's groups, um, di different living environments to do what they'd wanted to do. We were able to show that this was easy. And the people you really need on side are the local authority because they're the ones who hold the legislation for nursery schools, care homes in their area. And without exception, they've grasped it. In Birmingham and Solihull, I ran projects with both of the councils. Birmingham, we did a matching scheme between interested schools 
um, and um, care homes in Solihull, they were concentrating more on nurseries all over the country. And what we also saw is actually quite a lot of people publicising that work they've been really quietly doing for years and years. And now if you if you look for intergeneration, if you Google it, it's there, there's a real presence and you'll see people talking about things they were doing for 15 years or so that they just weren't talking about before. It really has changed everything. Through COVID, some people have managed to keep going with their projects, which is brilliant, obviously remotely, because I'm so aware that there are still people who are not able to visit their relatives in care homes. And I'm talking about this at a care home and home care conference next week, and I think it's going to be quite an interesting discussion. So how can we bring in, even with times as they are at the moment, how can we bring in the positives of this in, in ways that are acceptable to both the children and the older people without bringing in the risks that are inevitably there? So to summarise and give some time for hopefully you'll have a few questions for us. We know that through different, you know, environmental reasons that increase in length of life and lifestyle changes actually means that the prevalence of frailty is increasing. People are living longer, but as James described so nicely, you're not well for all of that time you're li living longer. Intergeneral research brings to intergenerational research brings together the two different age groups to improve the well-being of both. And that doesn't just need to be small children. So some of the um, younger people's groups in that were teenagers and particularly um, in societies as well where there have been changes in structure. So it's it's not everybody living together a way of bringing the teenagers in and, and getting them to understand older people better. What we were able to show in a in a small way, but I think valid. Um, showed that those intergenerational activities can have a real significant effect on mood, mobility and people's resilience. And Lavinia's fall illustrates that. And what it does is it builds friendships, it builds relationships and it changes everybody's lives for the better. Fabulous. We've already got a couple of questions, um, which uh, one is aimed at me from Rachel, and that says the benefits uh, mentioned the joy and interaction. Did you measure any enjoyment outcomes or effective attitudes? We didn't specifically measure those things, but we did what you might call an exit interview with all of our older adults. And we obviously spoke to them throughout the process, um, asking them about um, their experiences, the impact it had on their lives. And it was clear that almost universally, the older adults were happier. They found more joy in life. They had a reason to get up in the morning. And it wasn't just because they had relationships with the children. They they, they bonded with each other. So um, Fred and Ken, for example, became a famous double act who um, were inseparable after they'd managed to spend uh, a, a few weeks together in the nursery so it was clear although we didn't have an objective measure of um, enjoyment that it was clear that we saw marked improvements and importantly which were sustained well after we left we left after 10 weeks i went back several times before covid um, and you can still see that that level of joy you can see that the getting the enjoyment out of life and also the determination for this to change so, uh, Ken became an absolute activist for intergenerational activity and to the point where Extra Care, who are the, the, the charitable trust that provide the housing that we did the filming at, um, got a little bit fed up of Ken campaigning for them to build a permanent um, a nursery on site and he's still pushing very hard for that to happen. So we saw so many improvements in terms of positive attitude, um, it, it was clear that it had had that impact. Lovely. I've um, got a couple of questions, one for me and then one for both of us. Um, so first question is, um, is there published study of the work shown? So the reason that this isn't published is because the study didn't have ethics approval. So to publish it, we would have had to go through ethics. Now, this actually had a far more robust consent process than any um, actual research I've ever been involved with. So all of the children and all of the older adults had a very, very thorough psychological um, evaluation um, before taking part. And they were consented every single day um, about where they happy to be filmed and where they happy to take part. 
and at any point they could choose not to do something. So in series one, we didn't have a full set of results and there were a couple mis people missing from series two as well. And that's because our older adults found the process of being tested and just naming it tested so stressful, it was, it was ruining things for them. So we just said, that's fine, we won't do it. So no, it's not published. Um, that hasn't stopped people trying to publish our work and thankfully the peer reviewer sent it to me to, to say no. Nah. Um, but you can you can watch it and and it's reached millions of people in you know worldwide in in ways that actually something in a traditional journal wouldn't have. And then next question um, to both of us: What is the single best way to combat frailty? And to James, what's the most important environmental factor to reduce that red section of unhealthy aging? Uh, so quickly for me, the single best way to combat frailty is good public health and combating frailty starts in utero, it starts with maternal health and it's all the way through. And yeah, it, it's good public health, it's not having public health budgets um, stripped, it's you know assessing poverty, assessing all of those determinants of, of health. So not an easy one, unfortunately. It's not, and to answer the question on how we can reduce that red band of disease burden at the end of life, the sad truth is the one single biggest thing we could do is is to get rid of poverty and deprivation and if we did that and if we increase the standard of living for groups across um, the country then we would see significant health impact there's a an anecdote about the, the life expectancy in Glasgow as you travel from the center city center out to the leafy suburbs and the life expectancy of the average male increases by 30 years from the city center of Glasgow to the outer suburbs and that's it's driven by poverty and inequality so there are things you can do like eating healthily and exercising um, um, reducing your stress not smoking drinking a, no more than a moderate amount but sadly the single most important thing we could do is to actually to get to get rid of poverty and deprivation which is a frustrating answer because we're not really in control of that i have a question from karen which is were there any measures of the impacts of the young people in this program yes there were um alistair was the early years expert that looked at the um, the children, they were less structured in terms of the observation, so less objective, but we did see improvements in things like attention and use of language and attitudinal changes towards older adults. So although it's a slightly more qualitative set of results, it was clear that just in 10 weeks that the, the children who were involved in the programme did see what you could class as, as improvements in a number of different areas. Uh, and Dan, Dan has asked pretty much the same thing, which is, did you look at the children? Did you notice any cognitive changes? So yeah, again, it, it wasn't as structured as looking as looking specifically for for cognition in children. Um, but the, the social skills element of the question, absolutely, yeah, we saw definite improvements in in social skills and attitudes towards older adults. And again, this is just from from ten weeks of spending time with those older adults, which tells you how powerful it is. And particularly because there's such a big gap between these generations, that unless you've got grandparents, and under COVID this hasn't happened, unless you've got grandparents that are very closely involved in your life, children don't often get exposed to older adults all that much. I've got a couple more questions. One from Stan, a uh, very quick answer to this one. Did the study measure any biochemical changes in the participants, particularly the adults before and after the study? No, it didn't. That didn't stop the production company trying to convince me that we should be doing tests. But with that, it all comes out, um, again, really ethical, as in what would we do if we found an abnormal result um, and causing worry? Um, so we didn't do any biochemical tests. And then a really interesting question from Claire. Do our findings align well with those societies where multiple generations still live with each other and co-support on a daily basis? We often hear of the Italian diet, but is it possibly more to do with the Italian family lifestyle? I'd say yes, they do. And there's a fascinating book um, called The Blue Zones, um, very American style to read, but really interesting. Um, and it's National Geographic behind it. And it's looking at um, five populations around the world, actually very, very different societies, but where you've got intergenerational as normal and real that really that family structure. And there are certainly um, messages that come through it all strongly. Absolutely, I've got a quick question from Karen, which is thank you, where can we watch this programme? Um, this is going to sound really um, narcissistic, but I actually checked recently, and I think it is on all four. So you can find it online on all four, both series one and series two. 
um, if you do want to watch it. Sadly, you'll have to see this face occasionally, but I'm not on there that much. Um, but you will get, I genuinely, if you've not seen it, it's it's heartwarming, it's, it's educational, and you just get to virtually meet some wonderful older adults and some incredibly charming children. So if you do get the chance, it is still on all four. And it used to be listed on all four under award-winning um, television programs. So, um, and if you're, I'm just going to do some more shameless self-promotion. So if you're interested in the messages from this, also on all four is another um, series called The Restaurant That Makes Mistakes. And same production company, and um, I was involved with it. And actually the idea was hatched up during series two. And we set up a restaurant staffed by adults of working age with dementia. It's fascinating. It's a giggle. It's very sweary in places. It's not me. Um, so uh, if you've got young children, they, you know, you may not want to watch it um, in front of them. But some of the key messages that came out, it was the relationships, it's the sense of purpose that actually produced positive changes. And I found that really, really interesting. Um, and Karen, who said who's doing a project, please do um, please do connect with myself and James via LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, uh, if you if you want to get in touch um, about the project um, out of the US, so I've not got any more questions. I I've got one more from I've got I have one more from Rachel, um, which is actually a really it's a really intelligent question, which is is there a role for intergenerational care in reducing the costs of childcare and therefore contributing to to tackling poverty? It's, it's a, such a good question, and the answer is probably yes. There haven't been many. Um, if you like economic studies into looking at the benefits, but almost certainly, A, because you're having shared facilities, which often can reduce costs, B, because um, the number of staff obviously would then be reduced in terms of looking after these, uh, looking after the children, um, but, it, but equally, the improvements you would have in the, uh, the children would not counteract poverty, but would certainly give them a, a good start in life in terms of understanding aging and older adults. It's something that we want to see happen everywhere. Um, it's something that all the older adults that took part in the program are very keen. Now they've been through that process and built those bonds that they want to see everywhere. As Zoe said, the, the real difficulty is when you're trying to get a local authority to commit to um, funding these types of projects, which is why it often then falls to either uh, private companies or charitable organisations like Extra Care to develop these facilities, if they're lucky with a local authority on board, um, because it's particularly, um, obviously with what we've been through in the last 18 months and money being very tight, it's hard to invest in these services. It's a great question and I think it, it probably would have an impact, yes. I've got one more that's come up from Hamid Reza. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Osteoporosis in older people is a cause of less physical activity because of being afraid of fractures. How can we overcome the issue? Um, I don't think actually osteoporosis itself is a cause of less um, physical activity. Um, it's the fear of falling. And that can be um, absolutely terrifying for people, even if, you know, as a falls risk, they might actually score relatively low. But if they are afraid of falling, I've seen people have to move into 24 hour care after one simple fall without much of an injury at home because they are so frightened about what happens next. Um, so it, it's all about, it, it's back again to good public health. So encouraging people to be as active as they possibly can be, the importance of some resistance training, so not just cardiovascular, uh, you know, some lightweight work, um, but actually having all of this seen as normal. And I think one of the, the ways that we have so many things that are medicalized when actually they don't need to be. They're about living. And the term social prescribing, I think, really sums that up nicely. Um, social prescribing describes, you know, getting people more active, more engaged. But you stick prescribing on it and you can go to your doctor and get it. And it almost takes away that that level of, you know, an individual's responsibility or giving that individual permission to do it. So it's really, you know, being as healthy and active as somebody possibly can be, knowing that they've got limitations. And also not blaming people for when they can't take take part we need to often in in health and care services we don't listen to the person enough we don't take the attitude that shops do which is well that's where they're going how do we go to them we're like you're not doing it our way tough and I think really actually changing that whole attitude is what's going to be um, important Karen's asked what are our Twitter LinkedIn handles you can search for us both by name and our um, if you look up the uh, the biochemical society accounts you'll be able to get to us through that as well but I'm Jerry Baby, and James is a fat scientist. 
So, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and on that note, it's quarter past six, and um, I'm going to draw this to a close. So, um, thank you everybody for attending. You can continue the conversation online. So, it's follow um, at B underscore S underscore R underscore A and at Biochemical Society on Twitter. The session has been recorded, and so you can hear me insulting James forever. And the recording will be available to watch within a couple of weeks. Please visit the Biochemical Society and the BRSRA's websites for more details. Thanks to all and goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.